Hey, what's up everybody? Chad Kalick here, totally stoked. Just got the brand new uh, Australia merch in. Really excited. Uh, the countdown has begun. Tomorrow, everybody flies into Los Angeles. On Sunday, we get up, load all of our stuff, jam. 15 hour long flight down under, which I'm excited and nervous about, but um, I will see you very soon for the sold out uh, Blood Red Australian tour. Bye bye. Here we are. Just got into Brisbane, rolling with a shit ton of bags to uh, our pickup, our car pickup, so we can go to our hotel. Hey, great, sir. Hello. I know, it's exciting, huh? <laughs> you guys want to turn the air conditioning off and keep all the windows up? Yeah. <laughs> Let's do that. Okay. Is this the tour bus? Sharon, sure, this can't be the tour bus because there's there's far too little shit on this bus. <laughs> we need Sharon to collect a ton of shit and throw it everywhere. Hey, Sharon, are you guys a film crew or something? What? Uh, what yeah, filmmakers. Money? Filmmakers, yeah. We're touring for a documentary that awesome. we, we did paranormal stuff. Really? Yeah. Yeah. So. All right, are we ready to open up the doors? I think so. Yeah. Let's get you guys in. But he's playing some background music in the background. <laughs> and then suddenly it cuts to some guy burning in the middle of the pavement. Just completely burning. It was definitely an experience. Yeah. An eye opening. Yeah. I love the experiment they did too. I think almost like with the experiment at the end, like they were talking about how everyone was affected by the different feelings. Um, I think that happened with me being in the audience. Um, it's really interesting. I can't wait to see the part two. Wow. This is Laura getting to hold her first koala bear. Pretty amazing stuff. When you think of Australia, this is what you think of. Unbelievable. Truly the most beautiful coastline I have ever seen. Uh, here's the hotel right down below us here. See the pool where everyone's hanging out. Tracer, what's up? Hanging out with my partner in crime here. Yeah, pretty exciting. <laughs> Busy just having a good time as you can see. She got some new Crocs on here if you check them out, don't you? Got some new Crocs. So check out my new Crocs. <laughs> Thanks a lot. I got no terra fucking to sue. <laughs> the attitude of this planet at the moment is, is not in the right place, mate. And I think that. Oh, but that's only because I think the corporations have done a and good the media. job. They've done a good job of distracting us yeah. of yeah. how powerful we really are collectively. Right. Yeah. And that's, that's why you need people. Yeah. Chad, to put the, to, to, to put the truth. It, yeah, to, to get you a bit of enthusiasm into it, into it. <laughs> it's not as simple as that. Like they won't, like they won't shut them down in a way where you can see them shut them down. It's all behind closed doors. Yeah. Filmmaking process and the kind of 
puppetry of it all that I didn't even... You know, when I think back to that tour, it was an incredible time. There were so many amazing things that were going on at once. I had just had my daughter. I was becoming a father. Um, this was the first time that I had ever stepped foot on Australian soil. Uh, so to be able to go do it in a fashion where there's six sold out shows and you could play your movies for people and in each city you're welcomed by, you know, a group of people who are, um, you know, there to see your work. It is very flattering. Um, but I'm always impressed by the way life works. You know, when you think you're on one road and you have no idea that you're on another. And the reason I say this is because in Sydney, Australia, right before the event began, this group of people came in and they were clearly a paranormal team. Uh, they were outfitted. I mean, they're matching clothes. They looked like the military almost. They had their names on their sleeves and they walked with pride. They were stoked to be a team and you can tell. I didn't know at the time, but this was the West Sydney Paranormal Research Team. There's no way on earth I could say that that is a real ghost or whether I could debunk it. I need to be in that situation. I need to be there. I need to know the surrounding environment. I don't know what's on the other side of, 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 the, um, of the camera. I don't know what's next to it. What we need to do is we need to be on site. We need to have a look at it properly for ourselves. And I met them all individually and I'm really bad with names, but there was no way I could have forgot the name Craig Powell because he's a big dude. He's a big old beluga, you know, just you can't miss him. And he was clearly the leader of this team, um, very much a natural born leader. You could feel that right away. We spent some time talking and hanging out before the event. Uh, they were very gracious. They didn't, you know, inundate me with a million questions where, you know, I couldn't talk to other people. They were very patient. And that was that. And we went and did our show and, and uh, we had a blast. And, and I remember that was all done and I was hanging in my room just relaxing. And I'm not sure how it happened, but they all wound up at my door. They knocked on the door, and they were leaving, basically. And uh, they essentially just wanted to say thanks, had a great time. Uh, we took photos, and, uh, you know, I shared a bit of conversation with Craig. And I really liked the guy. I really liked the guy. He, he's very direct when he speaks to you. Uh, he had a, a, a very likable demeanor to him. And, uh, yeah, it was a blessing. I, I, I went back home, and I, I couldn't believe how great the tour went. And I got to thinking, how do I make the next tour better? How do I raise the bar? The one thing we didn't do on the Australian tours, we didn't ghost hunt. You know, Craig right away pops into my mind because, you know, they didn't just have matching t-shirts to have them. They were a real paranormal team and you can tell. So I got a hold of Craig through Facebook. Uh, I ended up giving him a call and said, I would love to come back again, but I would love to do a ghost hunt. And uh, if you can help me find a location, we can do it together. Which Craig says, I got the perfect place. The name of this location is Cockatoo Island. So it wasn't until about a week later when Craig called back to say we're confirmed that I did my research on Cockatoo Island. And what I found is that Cockatoo Island is unbelievable. Located in the heart of Sydney Harbour in Sydney, Australia, Cockatoo Island is believed to have initially served as an aboriginal fishing base before the island was taken over by convicts in 1839, when Sir George Gibbs, the governor of the colony of New South Wales, chose Cockatoo Island to be the home of a brand new penal establishment, in which for the next 30 years, Cockatoo Island would remain a convict prison, which endured horrible living conditions and backbreaking labor, as the prison also doubled as the primary grain storage facility for the colonies. In fact, historical records show that at its peak, convicts had shoveled and stored up to 140 tons of grain, in which countless prisoners died from heat exhaustion, breathing disorders due to grain dust, and malnutrition, before the prison finally ceased all running operations in 1869, in which all remaining convicts that were healthy enough to be transferred were sent to Darlinghurst Gowl for the remainder of their sentence. Completely surrounded by the waters of the Paramara and Lane Cove rivers, Cockatoo Island quickly became a prime spot for the construction of civilian-owned merchant vessels, or boats used to carry either cargo or passengers, in which the first recorded privately owned vessel construction took place in 1870, immediately after the dissolution of the prison. For the next 43 years, civilian-owned merchant vessels would continue to be constructed on Cockatoo Island until 1913, when the island was transferred to the Commonwealth Government to become the naval dockyard of the Royal Australian Navy. 
Due to a seemingly perfect design for a shipyard, 4,000 men were employed during the First World War, in which countless ships were quickly refitted and sent back into battle from Cockatoo Island. Cockatoo Island was the primary ship repair facility in the Southwest Pacific Theater of War, with over 250 ships that were converted or repaired on the island. In order to save the lives of thousands and thousands of young Americans. In 1991, the Australian government ceased all naval operations on the now historic island, with the Sydney Harbour Federation Trust taking control of the island in 2001. Today, Cockatoo Island serves as a public park and a campground. But like many historic locations steeped in lore and legend, if you look, just beneath the surface often lies a hidden history. And in the case of Cockatoo Island, that hidden history is literally buried just beneath the surface. In 2009, an archaeological dig on the island uncovered several hidden convict-era torture cells that had not only intentionally been filled in with dirt, but the naval cookhouse was built atop the hidden cells in an obvious effort to erase the facts and engineer a wanted history. So obviously, yeah, I called Craig back and said, we're in, we're gonna do it. We announced the event, tickets sold out quickly. Um, I flew back over there in which the day before the event, Craig had arranged to give us a tour of the place. Well, do you know what? There, there were always, there were always lots of stories from this, from this particular place. Right. The first few times we came here, it was pretty quiet. I mean, it's creepy at night time. It's scary as hell actually inside. But nothing, nothing really happened until we figured out. Well, they're always talking about a guy in, being seen in military uniform, looking out the windows or walking right. around up on the top level. If he's in military uniform, let's address him as sir. As soon as we did that, bingo. Yeah, bingo. Yeah. All of this is like so I'm listening to his stories, and uh, you know, it is what it is. I mean, I'm just kind of going around checking things out, and visually it was stunning. I was excited to ghost hunt there. It was cool. Hey, what's up, everybody? Chad Keelick coming to you from Sydney, Australia. Actually, I'm out of Cockatoo Island right now. Uh, an amazing, amazing day today. Got to tour the place and check it out. It is everything it's been billed as and more. Um, yeah, just keep looking. There's gonna be a lot of updates about this, a lot of photos, a lot of video. I'm getting some light here. Actually, right now we're checking out the walls that were actually in the Wolverine movie. There's some leftover set pieces here as well, too. Uh, but truly a fantastic place, Cockatoo Island is. Uh, so cannot wait for the event tomorrow night. Uh, much love, everybody. Thank you, everybody in Australia for bringing us here, everybody in Sydney. I can't even begin to tell you how excited our entire team is. This has been an amazing voyage already, and we're just beginning. So much love, and we'll see you guys soon. Peace. Bye-bye. You know what? I never knew. I, I discovered that when I was walking out with him. I was like, what the fuck is that lyric? I always thought she said she just smiled and gave me a bite of her sandwich. <laughs> That's what I thought it was. <laughs> Smile and give me a bitch sandwich. He said. It's actually it tastes just like cheese. Yeah, it's yeah. Really good. But yeah. it has cheese mixed in with it, right? Yeah. Pretty much cheese. Ooh. Ooh, it's salty. Salty, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that tastes better than what actual Benjamin <laughs> tastes like. Benjamin's more like salty. You, have you tried it? Kind of like I have. I don't like Benjamite, period. It's a lot stronger. You mean that just tastes like cheese? There's some more light. Salty cheese. So you gotta get a big old chunk, buddy. Joe just smile and give me a Vegemite. Sandwich. Shit's mother's milk, man. <laughs> I know, that's what I was doing. Mm. 
<laughs> it's just mother's, mother's milk. milk. <laughs> you Is that all, okay? Generally <laughs> like it. Yeah. So the next day comes and the show comes. And how these shows usually work is there's a meet and greet in the beginning, a Q&A session, an evidence presentation, followed by film screenings, followed by ghost hunt at the end of the night. Um, the evidence presentation is the part that we decided we would do together. Meaning the first 30 minutes of the evidence presentation, my team would present the most intense paranormal activity we've ever captured on film. And then the last 30 minutes, his team would present. Now, I'm proud to say uh, in the U.S. we have a reputation for having, you know, arguably the best evidence presentation that you will find. Good to have you here. So the question everyone has, are ghosts real? Are ghosts real? Such a simple question. Yet to most, it's unanswerable. But I have an answer. An answer that people come from miles away to experience. Because I don't just tell them the answer. I show them. Move something in this room. Oh, what the f So we give our presentation and it goes over great and the you know the crowd uh, loves it I could see on their face they're excited they're ready to go ghost hunting they're pumped up and uh, you know it's Craig's turn and the first thing Craig shows blows my mind it is him and his team in a room on Cockatoo Island in which there's no power in which these massive lights are going off and lighting up like bright white light in a room and just poof, illuminating everything, leaving no shadows, just bright as can be. And this freaks me the fuck out because I've experienced this. So I run over to my partner Thomas because he experienced this with me too. We were in Farrar, Iowa, a schoolhouse, and the same thing. This massive light went off that lit up the whole basement. Uh, of the schoolhouse. So I had experienced this before and Craig had caught this on film. And not only did he capture it on film, he caught it multiple times with many, many people in the room. Uh, so I was floored. talking to Thomas about the fact that we've experienced this and Craig has caught it which is really cool and uh, right as I'm about to finish my conversation with Thomas I could see Craig has moved on to another piece of evidence and I'm a smoker so I decided I'm gonna go have a cigarette real fast and as I'm walking out I hear Craig say in this next piece of footage that I'm gonna show you we captured a full body apparition and honestly right when I heard those words I was let down because I'm like, you have to understand, the full-bodied apparition is like the fucking Bigfoot of the paranormal world. Everybody talks about it. Everybody knows it exists. People have experienced it. 
but it's never been caught on film. I mean, never definitively. And in the last 20 years that I've seen full-bodied apparition footage, every fucking time it is faked. Every fucking time. So Craig plays this piece of footage and where the screen is set up, the light's kind of coming in and hitting the screen in which at the angle that I'm standing, I can't really see what he's showing. So out of pure curiosity, I go over and I look at his laptop and uh, but yeah, look, it's even hard to find words for it now. Uh, I was fucking floored. I knew the second I saw it, there was something very different about this footage. Uh, you know, I had a million questions, but it wasn't the time to ask because uh, we were going to play films soon and then we had a ghost hunt, uh, which we did. We played the films and then the ghost hunt comes. And how these ghost hunts work is usually an investigator or a tandem of investigators will take 15 to 30 people and they'll split up in different areas and every 45 minutes they'll kind of switch, right? Um, and you go to different locations which have the strongest legend and lore of paranormal activity. So we start out in this room in Cockatoo Island, a very large room, probably 30 yards by 20 yards. So big, you know, big location. And there's like 25 of us in there, maybe 20 of us in there. And I'm talking within minutes, I hear this piece of metal fly against the wall. And we all hear it. I mean, the room jumps from it. I run over the corner, look, and there's this square piece of metal sitting on the floor. And I'm like, someone had to have fucking thrown this. And right as I say that, over my shoulder in the opposite corner that I just came from, it sounds like glass breaks. So I run over, and there's no glass on the floor. There's nothing anywhere. And I'm like, what the fuck? And minutes later, we're hearing footsteps right in the middle of the room, although nobody's moving. You can hear the shuffle of feet. And at this point, I'm honestly wondering, is Craig and his team just fucking magicians? I mean, have they wired this shit to do that? I mean, like, am I in the middle of the biggest fucking hoax ever that I've experienced? Because the paranormal is not like that. You have to understand it very rarely happens. It's almost impossible to document, much less experience on a consistent basis. And I'm seeing full body apparition footage, lights blasting, shit's flying around this room and minute. I mean, it just seemed like, you know, either Cockatoo Island is the most haunted place on fucking earth, you know, or this is all fake, you know? Part of me was pissed. So, anyways, right before our group's going to switch, I go out and have a cigarette. And as I'm coming back in, I could see, you know, Craig's outline. Like I say, he's a big old fucking baluka. He's just walking and he's got the team with him. And I see a gentleman trailing behind that walks back into the room that we were just at. In which I hustle up and run to the room and say, hey, we got to go down to the next room. And I realize when I'm in there that I'm talking to no, I mean, there's nobody in there. And don't confuse what I'm saying here. Like, I didn't think I saw a ghost. I saw a person. The outline of a person walk into a room with no exits. I never took my eyes off the door. It was 20 feet in front of me. I ran in and no one's there. No one's there. Now, I'm not guessing if this happened. This happened, okay? So I'm, I'm floored by this place. I'm floored. And I have a billion questions for Craig. Now, I met you 
a little over a year ago on our first tour through, and uh, you know, you guys really seem to have your shit together. What was your purpose and reason for starting this? Many years ago, when I was a young guy, when I was 16, I had my first experience. Uh, I believe I saw what I now know to be a ghost or an apparition. That moment changed my life forever, and it led me on this path that I'm on now. And it's what it's what's led me here today. What are the challenges you face? This organisation is like my family. We really have to be able to trust the people that we research with for many various reasons. Um, right. Well, I mean, not the obvious one. You gotta know everybody's on the level when you're- Exactly right. right, exactly right. And I need to know that when I'm in the dark, in a really scary place, right. that someone's got my back right. and they need to know that I'm there for them too, should shit get real. Right. Yeah. When you travel and you're away, you have kids as well. Is it difficult to be away from children? Or does the passion kind of, you know, consume that? Yeah, it's always hard to be away from your kids. The older I get, the more I realize that everything I do is for them. Sure. Yeah. Um, even in regards to the paranormal, paranormal for them is not paranormal, it's normal. I'm really fascinated now with how people do this, having kids. You know, because Gracie's changed everything for me. Very fortunate. Who gets to do this? You know what I mean? This is your first time to Australia. Pretty cool, right? Yeah, it's amazing, man. <laughs> yeah. You know what it is? It's like this. Remember, we used to manage bands, and yeah. we could say, this band's going to maybe make it, and this band will make it. Yeah. And you make that decision because some of those guys got into play music to get pussy, or some of them got yeah. in it to try to be famous. And the, some of them got in it because they were born to play music, man. That's right. just, that's what they, they, right. they don't have a choice. Sometimes they fucking want to quit and right. they keep coming back to it because they just didn't have a choice. You know, for a while in, in America, they were throwing fucking TV shows out to any motherfucker who picked up a camera and ran around the dark. <laughs> Spirits are rolling tonight. Oh, I can't wait to get out there and chase those ghosts. I wanted to check that area for any potential uh, traces of blood or anything like that. Yeah. What do you think of that? What the f Kids! Hey! He's not Go going Go fight in the back seat! I'll pull this car over! Right over! You're grounded! Sorry, Both of you! You caused it all and caused him to... Ah! I mean, it was like, that's not going on over here. It's not like everybody who has a team is getting a deal. So these guys are more organized and they're doing more without even that being like this in-game for them. You know what I mean? Like, they're just doing it. And that's right here. It's rare to find that. So I flew home. I told my wife about this. And I knew I needed to get a hold of that footage. And I needed to find out if this stuff was authentic. Because if this was all real, this is the type of shit that could change the world. So I called Craig very gingerly and basically asked for the footage. And I told him that I am interested in finding out if this is real. And if it is, I would like to share his story with the world. So I set out to determine if this was real. And I told Craig, you gotta be open to me coming after you, man. If you say yes to this, I'm gonna dig into your lives, I'm gonna find out who you are, I'm gonna look at every angle possible, I'm gonna to try to figure out if this was hoaxed, if it wasn't, uh, then, you know, that will present itself. But if it was hoaxed, and I find out, I will tell the world that too. I, I gotta be honest, uh, the footage that you shared with me, I think it is the most uh, definitive evidence I've ever seen. It is one of two things, you have, legitimately captured a full body apparition and paranormal activity on film or you are pulling off one of the greatest hoaxes ever but i'm gonna have to you know hold you and your team to the coals to get to the bottom of this and to be mm -hmm. certain so the viewer can be certain that this wasn't hoaxed in any fashion and are you up for that are you up for uh, me asking you any question that I want about anything. Brother, I'm up for anything, but it, it, it is what it is. If I was hoaxing this, this thing would have gone out years ago, two years ago. And you know that we are quite open. If anyone's got any answers to it, if anyone can explain it, 
I'm more than willing to, to listen and, and go through it and, and see if that's the case. But it, it, it is what it is. I, I've got nothing to hide. 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 Six hours ago, a guy that I befriended about a year ago named Craig Powell sent me several pieces of film um, of events, strange things that he captured. The reason I'm so tired right now is because I have watched this footage for six hours straight. Either Craig and his team have pulled off one of the most advanced, complex hoaxes that the paranormal field has ever known, or the footage that I'm looking at. If this footage is real, and I will find out if it is, then Craig has definitively proven that ghosts exist. In addition to both of the videos that you saw earlier of the unexplained flashing lights that were believed to be emanating from an entity named Sir, the following footage you're about to see represents a large portion of the body of evidence captured at Cockatoo Island by Craig Powell and the West Sydney Paranormal Research Team. Upon request, this footage was sent directly to me by Craig at 12.05 a.m. on November 8, 2015, in which each clip arrived in MP4 format. Beyond adding date, time, and location stamps, upon initial inspection, this footage does not appear to be manipulated in any fashion. In Exhibit 3, on February 21, 2014, after setting three motion detectors in the boat shed, in which any motion detected whatsoever would trigger the light indicator on each motion detector, at 2.23 a.m., the following occurred. Exhibit 4, February 28, 2015. In this footage, Powell is explaining to his team that only moments ago, from across the largest room in Building 15, his flashlight briefly illuminated the full-body apparition of a blonde-haired child spirit. Shadow impressions. I saw it with the torch, standing in the corner watching me put all that shit down. Oh boy, what did he look like? Shadow. Huh? How, yeah, that would explain this Just a little white kid. Blonde hair, dark hair. Blonde hair. How, so this conversation right? continues on oh, for several Jesus. minutes. Before at exactly 10.05 p.m., something truly terrifying occurs. Oh, fuck! Jesus Christ! What, what, what? Turn your light, turn your light. Describe or explain it. That was really quick, though. Um, we're not sure if we heard the same things, but it was at exactly the same time. Oh, fuck! Jesus Christ! What, what, what? Turn your light, turn your light. Oh, shit. <sighs> to this day, the cause of the loud snapping sound remains a mystery. But at the precise moment of the snapping sound, Powell was on record stating that he felt the back of his shirt get pulled and tugged in a violent fashion. In Exhibit 5, on February 15, 2014, in the hallway of Sir's house, something incredible happened, something unimaginable, something that could change the world as we know it today.
at exactly 2.37 a.m. in the hallway of Sir's house with an incredibly fluid motion that appears to defy all natural human movement and physics. What can only be described as a full body apparition leans around the doorway at the back of the hall just long enough to get a direct look at the camera before sliding back behind the wall but not before allowing the time it took to notice its near perfect human figure which is ever so oddly combined with the complete lack of discernible facial features hence the nickname sir no face sir no face sir no face furthermore Due to the compelling nature and the potentially life-altering implications associated with proving the authenticity of the Sir No-Face footage, it's important to understand the details surrounding the night in which the Sir No-Face footage was captured. As the co-founder and leader of WSPR, Powell has provided me with the following official record of events. On February 14th, 2014, WSPR team members Cat Lyons, Richie Reporta, and Craig's wife, Nikki Myers, arrived on Cockatoo Island just past 5 p.m., in which they would be the only WSPR members conducting investigations on Cockatoo Island throughout the night, as Powell was at home with he and Nikki's children, Rocco and Diesel. After selecting their tents and preparing them for a night of camping, shortly after sundown, which was at precisely 7.48 p.m., Kat, Richie, and Nikki made their way to Sir's house, also known as the officer's quarters, in which a single security guard unlocked the door and granted them access to what would become a nearly two-hour investigation. With no activity reported, at exactly 9.55 p.m., just after Kat set the camera that would eventually capture the Sir No-Face footage, upon exiting the building, Nikki met with security, in which she visually watched him lock the door of Sir's house, just before the security guard escorted Nikki, Cat, and Richie across campus to the Billawilla house, in which once again, security unlocked the doors, thus granting them access to investigate. With no activity reported at the Billawilla house, exactly one hour and ten minutes after the investigation began, Cat, Richie, and Nikki ended the investigation, in which not only did Nikki meet with the security guard to lock the doors of the Billowilla house, but she also received confirmation that Sir's house had remained locked as well, and would throughout the night. Shortly after, at 12.15 a.m., Nikki, Cat, and Richie returned to their tents at the campground. And as a final confirmation, at 1.20 a.m., just before falling asleep, Nikki again spoke with the active security guard on duty as he made his rounds, in which he assured Nikki that all buildings were locked and secured, including Sir's house. After a short night of sleep, Kat, Nikki, and Richie met the security guard at Sir's house just after 6 a.m., in which after retrieving their camera, all three investigators were on the 6.30 a.m. ferry to the mainland. The footage captured by Kat was sent to Powell that afternoon, in which he was informed that it was a slow night with nothing much to report. When all was said and done, the camera began recording at 9.50 p.m. and ran for 5 hours and 42 minutes before losing battery power. At exactly 4 hours and 47 minutes into the recording, at precisely 2.37 a.m., Sir No Face said hello to the world. Hello, it is me talking to me in my own video blog here. I'm just recording this little place in time. I'm packing up my bags right now to head to Australia tomorrow night for our third tour. But I'm also going to get the chance to sit down with the WSPR crew and interview them and try to find out what the fuck is going on with this footage and with Cockatoo Island. And I'm going to try to shake them up and stir them up a little bit. You know, I, I really do pray they didn't hoax this footage. Uh, because what it means if they didn't um, but we live in a world where sometimes good people can do bad things so hopefully that's not the case um, but right now I'm counting down the hours till I get on that plane and arrive in that beautiful country god I love Australia it is gorgeous the country definitely has a piece of my heart uh, cannot wait to get back there
So, where are you actually from? Here or New Zealand? I grew up my whole life here. Okay. So I classify, classify myself an Aussie, except when it comes to the rugby and the All Blacks put that black shirt on, then, you know, um, you know, it, it's black through and through. But I predominantly, man, this, this, is, where, this is where I grew up. Right, right. Now, what, now, what is your lineage? You were saying your father is... So, my father's English from a... Um, uh, he was from England. Okay. And he met my mother in New Zealand. She is... Uh, she's New Zealand Māori. So, you know, the bloodline, it's, uh, you know, there's a... There's a mix there and it's quite... Um, uh, it, it's made me the person I am today, you know. But, yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, the, the, the Maori side really takes over, so... Yeah, you know, very much, you know, the warrior blood runs through my veins, you know, as you can tell by all the... Sure. By all the... mentioned football yeah uh, I, I know a little bit about your past I know you played professional rugby I, 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 I played at a high standard you know I, I, I love the game you know growing up it was probably one of the only things I was ever good at yeah um, I wasn't much of an academic I wasn't real good at school um, I, I more or less went for the social aspect just hanging out with the guys you yeah know. Uh, but football, you know, rugby league was probably one of the only things I was ever good at. And my dad seemed to like me more because I was good at it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And it was funny that, you know, when, when, when it stopped, my relationship kind of did with him as well. Really? You know? so, I didn't know that. Yeah, it was, you know, it's not that, um, you know, my, my mum and I are very much the same. Which causes, you know, when you have two really strong wheels button heads all the time, it's right, right. You know, it causes a lot of tension. So, you know, I love my mum to death, but never really got along with her. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, um, That's something you and I also both have in yeah, common. Yeah, and you know, I'm assuming that hurt. It is what it is, man. Right, you know right, what I mean? It's right, it's right, right, right. It, it's not like he hated me or I hated him. It was it's, it's it is what it is. Well, look, if you spend five minutes with you, it's easy to see that your children mean everything to you. And uh, how many how many children do you have? Well, uh, I've got I've got two stepkids okay. and uh, and little Diesel, who's who's mine. Yeah, yeah. And obviously, you can see he's your world. He's not with us now, but he's with me. You know, yeah, yeah. it seems like everything I do uh, in my life now it's 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 for his betterment. It's you know. And he's you know? nine years old. He's nine years old. And he's old. already doing MMA. Yes, that's right. And he's doing rugby. And and I've met him. And and in about an hour, I fell in love with him. I mean, he's just a, the most adorable little kid in the world. And he definitely has that edge to him. You can definitely see it in his eyes. He has that determination, you yeah. know? Yeah. Well, I mean, that's a, I think that's a big part of your character. When I first met you, that was one of the things that I saw that mattered to me. I mean, I have a three-year-old daughter, same way. I'm here, and she's with me. Yeah, you know? exactly. How did you know who I was. Nikki and I were in, in the, the um, uh, shopping centre one day, the local shopping centre, and we walked past, this was in the days where they used to have DVD stores, yeah. right? We walked past the DVD store and sitting in the discount box was this DVD that said Most Haunted in big green bold writing and a couple of people standing on the front of it. And I, I kind of took my eyes straight away so I went over and I grabbed it and I had a look at it and I said, I said, Nick, check this out. There's these guys running around in the dark looking for ghosts. <laughs> Most Haunted was probably the one of the, the first paranormal show I'd ever seen. Yeah. And for me, it was like, wow, there's people out there actually doing this stuff. 
Yeah. And from there, it just led on to other paranormal shows. Right. And then we found Paranormal State. Okay. Which obviously, you know, we, we saw you on. Okay. And, you know, leading off from that as well, you know, your American Ghost Hunter movie and 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 the um, the trailers and the advertisements you were doing for A Blood Red Sky at the time too. Yeah. So we obviously knew of you. You know, you never even told me about your evidence when I was in the States. You never said, oh, I've caught so much shit here and like that. You just said, I got this place on lock. We've investigated it. Uh, I can get you on there. You didn't really give me the story at all until I got over here. And uh, I always wondered why. You came to us saying, look, I want to do this. Right. I had the place. I was like, well, let's see if we can get you on there. It wasn't about us. It was about helping you yeah. to, to bring you back again to, to do your shows. One of the days that blew me away the most is when you said to me, look, we're going to do this. I'd like you to come out and, you know, stand with me and maybe show some of the evidence that you've yeah. captured. And I thought, well, seeing we're on Cockatoo Island, why not show some of the people, or show the people some of the, the stuff that we caught right. on the island. So we did this event, and you started showing this footage, and I was fucking floored by what I saw. And my first thought was, I want to help Craig present this to the world. I love these guys, they're so cool, these are such nice guys. And my next thought was, I'm gonna make a movie. Oh my God, I'm gonna make a movie about this, this is worth doing. And then I stopped right there and I didn't talk to you about it because, Craig, I have been fucked over in my life. And it seemed a little fishy. It seemed very much to me like, wow, you know, here's, come on over, we'll help you. You come into my room as a VIP, you know, Yes, I asked you to make the movie, but I did stop and go. Of course I would if you put this kind of fucking carrot in front of me. And it wouldn't take a genius to figure that out. And I held back. I didn't ask you anything about the film when I was over here. And I thought a lot about it. I honestly kind of thought I need to know them better. And to, to decide if I can determine if this is, you know, a trap, to be honest. You know, we live in a world where fame is a weird animal anymore. People become famous for bullshit and, and opportunity happens. And I was really nervous about asking you to make this movie. For whatever reason, I decided to take a leap. And did you have any intention of me putting this out, of me being the one? No. None at all? No. No, never. I, I never thought that this where we where we're sitting now. Never thought that this would happen. Never had a discussion with your team about maybe Chad can make a film about us or evidence anything. Nothing. Never. Never. Look back on that time at Cockatoo Island. You could have left that room, walk out, have a cigarette, come back in. That all would have been over and done with, and you would have known. You would have been none the wiser. To this day, you could be none the wiser. Because how many times did I send that piece of footage to you via email saying, Chad, check this out. Chad, check this out. Look at this one. Look at this one. How many times did that happen? You, there was a point where you were this close from never seeing that footage. It just so happened that for whatever reason, you stopped, you turned around and you had a look. Let's just talk about Cockatoo. Yep. Okay. I've seen all the footage. It's fucking mind-blowing footage. Um, I know you weren't there the night that No Face was captured. How convenient. How convenient, Craig. You're not there when your team catches the most amazing piece ever. So you can't really go down if it's faked, and it comes out that it's faked. You can just kick the team out and whisper, right? Get out, whisper moves on. You're not there. The one night where this all happens, you're not there, but, your wife's there, and your wife says, I was with security guards all night and multiple times checking in. Perfect alibi. Sounds good. Why? Like, why, why did this all happen that way? It happened because it was meant to happen, man. This is my headspace. It's not like, wow, look at all of this stuff we've caught. My headspace is, fuck, what have I missed? What has happened out there when we're not there that I'm missing out on? I'm just saying, I mean, if I, if I play it back, it just kind of seems like... You're not there, but your wife is there, who's going to be your ultimate protector in anything. 
She just happens to say throughout the night, she's the one that went and checked in the security guards. No one else did, but your wife did. And look, the person that benefits from this the most is you, man. It would be very simple for someone to look at this and just go, they're sinking their money into it. He has these fucking amazing children that he would do anything for. You know, here's this guy that comes to town that could change his whole life. I mean, look, if this footage does what I think it could do, Craig, you will be the fucking name that goes down in history, in fucking history of the paranormal. Trust me when I tell you, your life will change. That's a big reason to fake shit. At the end of the day, people are either going to see it and believe it, or they're gonna take it with a grain of salt and think it's fake. Well, they're, the, they're, the, gonna, they're the, gonna do more than that. My neighbor is the best software animator. He is the guy that was hired to create Transformers. As one of the elite animators working in Hollywood today, Patterson specializes in computer-generated imagery, also known as CGI. Routinely hired as a senior animator on major studio feature films with budgets in excess of $100 million, Patterson's understanding and ability to digitally manipulate film is amongst the best in the world. Here's a few examples of films you may know that feature Patterson's CGI work and abilities. There were many changes. Some you could see, some you couldn't. Yeah, it started growing in all sorts of places. So he can take that footage, and he can tell me without a shadow of a fucking doubt if that has been fucked with, if it's fake, or anything else. Do you know what? What? I've been waiting for someone to say that, man, because I don't have the ability to do that myself. I do. Well, let's, let's do it. Do it. <laughs> to be continued. To be continued. To be continued. To be continued. So this is uh, this is building number two. This is the military guard's house. This is where all the light phenomena happened inside here, and this is where the um, this uh, footage, so no face footage, was captured as well. Locked up. This is the room here. The camera was actually sitting in this far corner. And just out through the door there is where the surf, the surf footage came from. Okay. Yeah, that's it. Huh. And light would fill every corner of the room. There were no shadows, it didn't cast shadows when it, when it flashed. It's one of the most bizarre things I've, I, I've ever seen with my own eyes. Coming across on the ferry today, I can see that. You know, yeah. this this place, it's just, it's got a bit of me. Hey, like I left something here with us. You know, we got so emotionally involved in this place, for, and I don't know why. It's it's an old rundown island. These things, these entities, these spirits are crying out for someone to listen to the story. And you're the guy 
that listened to it. You know? You saw something in that footage, man, that needs to be told. And this this I I wouldn't know. I wouldn't know how to I wouldn't know how to fake that shit, man. My team, the one thing I've got to be brutally honest about my team is that they keep everyone fucking honest, man. 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 While I truly appreciate Powell's sincerity throughout this entire interview, there were two specific things said by Powell in which I'm deeply concerned. First off, during my last trip to Australia, Powell took my team and I to see the Canterbury Bulldogs play a rugby match, in which I honestly fell in love with the sport. While at the game, and several times after, Powell told me that he played professional rugby for 11 years, in which he also said that he played for the Canterbury Bulldogs. Yet when I asked about his career as a professional rugby player, he gave the following response. I know a little bit about your past. I know you played professional rugby. I, I, I played at a high standard, you know. I, I, I love the game. You know, growing up, it was probably one of the only things I was ever good at. Yeah. I didn't get to the stage where I, I could have been as, as, as good as I should have been Yeah. Um, through injuries and, and other bits and pieces. But, you know, I played to a, a high level and, you know, I played with some of the guys that, you know, were running around as and classified as some of the best today. So yeah. Now, perhaps I'm interpreting his answer the wrong way, but I took his response to me. I played at a high level with some of the guys that became pros, although I was not a pro. Which, if that were the case, that would mean that Powell has lied to me now on several occasions about his past. And if he would lie about something as trivial as rugby, could I trust him to be truthful about the events that led to the video recording of what could arguably be the most important piece of paranormal evidence ever captured on film? I don't know. But what I also find troubling is that in order to establish a factual historical survey for this documentary about Craig's past, I asked Powell for either video footage or a simple photo of him playing professional rugby, in which Powell stated that no such photos or video currently exist. Needless to say, this is an area of Powell's life that deserves more attention. If Powell is lying about his rugby past, I want to know why. And the second part of the interview that bothered me came when I told Powell that I was going to have CGI expert animator Danny Patterson review the Sir No Face footage, in which Powell adamantly makes the following statement. I've been waiting for someone to say that, man, because I don't have the ability to do that myself. I do. Well, let's do it. So we you will know? find out. Let's do it. To be honest, the second I heard Powell make this statement, I was overcome by a sense of anger, which began to show before I quickly pulled back my emotions. If that motherfucker is fake, Craig, Craig, <laughs> let's do it. <laughs> to be continued. To be continued. To be continued. But why was I so angry that Powell stated that he didn't know any animators that could have weighed in on the footage to determine if it was CGI? I'll tell you in just a second, but what's important to note is that I was so frustrated with this response that I actually canceled the following morning's scheduled events so that I may conduct another interview with Powell in which the sole purpose of that interview was to once again see what Powell's response would be in regard to learning that I would have arguably the top CGI animator in the world review the Sir No Face footage to determine its authenticity. To my surprise, not only did Powell once again claim to lack any contacts with any animators with CGI based knowledge, but he also doubled down on what I call the hillbilly approach which is to minimize he and his team's resources, knowledge, and abilities by understating who they are, where they're from, and what they had available to them to pull off such a hoax. You know, there's two ways that this could be staged, basically. You know, one is actively staging it, like a person does it when they're there. The other way that could potentially be staged is CGI, all right? 
So, you know, as filmmakers, Justin and I, to a degree, could have some input on this because we are trained to understand light, uh, to understand audio, to understand visuals, especially Justin. I mean, Justin is um, my DP, so I'm going to have him go over the footage and give me his opinion as to what he thinks it could be. And then um, my friend Danny does all the animation for Transformers, for Avengers, for Iron Man, and obviously that stuff's photo real. Um, he'll be able to look at it too so we can answer that question, is it CGI? So when I go back to America, there's still a call for us to have when I get through all of this, okay? Um, are you cool with that? Nothing to hide, brother. Never had, yeah. had anything to hide, you know that. Um, I've always said the truth knows no fear. Yeah. I have nothing to fear. I know. I, I, if someone's got an explanation as to what that thing is, yeah. tell me. Yeah. Let me know. Because it's got me stumped. Yeah. And not forgetting that we're just a little team out in the western suburbs of Sydney with a couple of computers and some cameras. To pull off a CGI hoax of this magnitude, it would only take one animator with one computer and they could do this in the west Sydney suburbs or anywhere else that one could plug in a computer. So, you know, coming from my point of view, I'd love someone with knowledge right. to actually say, look, this thing is what it is, is what it is. As a country, Australia is amongst the world's leaders in post effects and animation, in which film production companies from all over the globe farm out their CGI needs to the Australian special effects industry. In fact, Gold Coast Australia which is often referred to as Hollywood Down Under, is specifically known for not only its cutting-edge CGI advancements, such as the development of massive software, which was used by Peter Jackson in the Lord of the Rings saga, which was shot just across the water in New Zealand, but Gold Coast is also known for its oversized CGI filming lots, in which such feature films as The Rock's San Andreas and Johnny Depp's Pirates of the Caribbean have been filmed there. But even though Gold Coast is well known for its feature film production, you might be surprised to know that it's actually the third largest film production center in Australia, just behind Melbourne and guess where else? Yep, Powell's Backyard, Sydney, Australia. The bottom line is that there are countless animators that live and work in Sydney. At any time, Powell could have picked up the phone and made a call to a multitude of CGI houses in either Sydney, Melbourne, or Gold Coast, in which within 24 hours, Powell could have received the feedback that he's claiming to have so desperately been waiting for. I've been waiting for someone to say that, man, because I don't have the ability to do that myself. I do. But even if it never occurred to him to call any of the effects houses to analyze the no-face footage, I still find it truly difficult to believe that a person who spent his entire life growing up in a film market, who's also an amateur filmmaker, could lack a single contact with animation skills. It just didn't make sense to me. Well, as it turns out, after doing a little bit of research on WSPR, Powell must know at least one person with CGI skills, as the following opening sequence of WSPR's online investigation series, Tailgate Terrors, which is directed, produced, and edited by Powell, does in fact feature professional level CGI animation. Everything in my heart tells me that Powell is being honest with me, but in two specific situations, the facts are not lining up. And while I truly enjoy Powell's friendship, when it comes to my job as a documentarian, as I told him in the beginning, the only thing that matters to me are the facts. Could Craig be lying to me? Could the Sir No Face footage be nothing more than a computer-generated image? As of right now, I have far too much work to do before I can make such a determination. But when the time is right, no matter what, I have to address both of these issues with Powell, as he absolutely deserves the right to answer before I come to any final conclusions. What did you experience at Cockatoo Island? I witnessed the lights. 
You witnessed the lights. Yes. Okay, so you're From telling me that you and a bunch of people sat in a room with no power, and That's the correct. room was lighting up. Yes. But it didn't. It didn't just. It didn't start off like that. It, it was kind of like shimmers, and then it then faint, and it just built built up. It got stronger and stronger the longer we were there. Different rooms, different heights. I even saw colors like green. Yeah. And how many other people, roughly, how many other people do you think experienced When it was just this? Whisper, it would have been a small group of us, maybe three, maybe four. Right. Uh, we had we had a larger group for filming here and there, and that was maybe uh, 10 to 12. Wow. But that, that's when it seemed to ramp up, when there was more energy. What was your take on it? Like, what, what did you think was happening? Knowing that there's no electricity, electricity and we're, we try to debunk it with boat lights, because, of course, it's on the harbour, stuff like that, cars going past... Nothing would generate that kind of light. Did it ever cross your mind that somebody there was up to something? No, I, I trusted my, my team. I trusted Craig. Why? And Why do you trust him? It's, uh, it's my team. And um, I know Craig would not do anything. He's very credible. He's just like, he's your mate. Mm. He's good. He's good. Mm-hmm. And you're prepared to answer the questions from the world. People email you and say, whatever, dude, what, you're, you, you would stand by that. I know what I experienced and what happened, and I'm, I feel blessed to, to have gone through that. You do understand this sounds fucking crazy. To everybody else, I, I don't really care. The 12 times I was there, every single time I was there, I saw Sir's lights 12 times. Incredible. I've only been there I think about four or five times to the island in general. I joined the team, I think I'm the last person that joined the team. Okay. Um, so it was kind of like an initiation for me to go onto the island to okay. see how well I handled the experiences sure. that the other guys were having there. What did you witness yourself at Cockatoo Island? When I was there, the first first thing that I witnessed was the flashing lights. Okay. Um, we were all sat around, I guess, the border of one of the rooms and it was just like a big explosion of light. The whole room just filled with light. I'm just going to ask you, straight up, did anybody fake this? No, not to my knowledge. Did you fake it? Absolutely not. Absolutely not. the footage I've seen. Yeah. Okay. What were you present for? I was present and responsible for setting up the camera that captured Peekaboo. The no, well, what we call Sir No Face. Sir No Face, okay. yeah. Um, who is that? What are we looking at? Um, I can't pinpoint exactly what it is. I can't wrap my head around it. No possibility someone staged it. I set that camera up, I went outside, called security, locked that building up, moved on to another building. I woke up the next morning, I went up, got security, opened it up and retrieved the camera again. Once we had discovered the footage, we had asked security that who were on that shift that night, did they ever go into the building? They said no, they don't go into the buildings, they just go around to make sure they're all locked on their rounds. Wow. It's a very hard piece of footage to wrap your mind around. Oh, definitely. Because it's so definitive, either it is a spirit or it is a hoax. You know, when people watch this stuff, I mean, they're going to say they have every reason to hoax this. Yeah. Because, look, it could be great for the team if people buy into it. Fame is something people have capitalized on for years. You know, when someone says to you, this is all bullshit. Mm-hmm. You know you did it. What do you say? I can only account for what I did for that evening and what was happening. I know throughout the evening when we were walking through there, Floorboards Creek, gravel outside the front door. So when you walk in, you can hear the crunching as it, you know, it's on the bottom of your shoes. Yeah. There's no sound on that video piece whatsoever. Ah, ah that's interesting. I never thought about that. Yeah. Yeah, you don't hear anything. No. Craig and I went back another night and we tried to recreate that whole scene yeah. and debunk it. But we would come up so clear on that footage. I you saw knew that. it was a person. Yeah. 
So like if someone says to you, do you believe that is a spirit? For me, I'm never comfortable to say definitely it is a spirit. That's definitely something I can't put my finger on. Do you believe it's a human? The organic flow of it and the trans, the semi-transparency of it, I couldn't say it's human based on the, the recreations we've done. I can't say it's the same thing, being someone human and someone that's not human. So when you go to do uh, investigations, you do the history of the place? Yeah, that's right. Very cool. And a living history and paranormal history? Living history. Okay, yeah. great. Are you guys paid? No. So it's completely, with 100% volunteer? Yeah, 100%. The entire team? Mm -hmm. Okay. Would you guys like to get paid? Um, well, it'd be nice. <laughs> sure, sure. No, it's an honest Sometimes, question, right? But sure. I mean, you know, the payment is being able to go to these places, not having to pay to go there. And, right, right, right. Yeah. So the lights. Yep. Explain to me what you witnessed. The first time I saw it, we were over in another area and some of the guys came over and said they'd seen some lights in the house and we wanted to try and debunk it. So we went over there. It's an island, there's you know, land across the water. We were trying to see if there were car lights that were coming in into the windows, shining on the walls or whatever. So we were there for quite a while trying to figure out what it could possibly be, where these lights they were seen were coming from. And while we're actually doing that, we actually experience the light right there. And you're saying that in this room, yeah. that a bright light emanated on multiple occasions. Yes. With no electricity in the building. Yes. And you witnessed this. Correct. Anybody, anybody on the team could have faked it? You ever thought about this? Is it possible that somebody on your team could have found a way to create this? Uh, it was a very bright light, so it wasn't just like someone shone a torch on, on and off. It was quite blinding. Right. And it appeared to be coming from the center of the room, although some people were seeing it. In different elsewhere. places. Yeah. Yeah. The Sir No Face footage, you weren't there that night. No. Any chance you think any team member created this? I, I really don't think so. I, they tried to debunk it. You could clearly see the features of the people on the video. Yeah, and I've seen that footage too, and I agree. Yeah. When you put a person there, it's a person. <laughs> I fully agree with you on that. So you think that footage is legitimate? I do. How long have you been in the team? Uh, about five years. Five years? Yeah, five years. So you know these guys well? Yeah, I know them really well. I know them really well. Too well. Too well. <laughs> No chance anybody on your team faked it? If I ever believe that one of our team members faked it, I'll throw him off the fucking balcony. No. Really? Nah, there's, why would we go out and do that? No possibility that they hoaxed this stuff and pulled it off. I'll bet my life on it. You bet your life on it? I'll bet my kids' life on it too. That's how confident I am with the... With you would bet your kids' life on yeah, it? Yeah, and I love them heaps too, so that's a statement. Yeah, it is. I have a little girl, and it would take yeah, a lot for me to so, say something about that, yeah. But, no, I don't think... No, I know for a fact. You experience the lights too? Yeah, experience the lights. And this is all to you legitimately paranormal activity? Yeah. You think that's what's going on there? Well, I think so. I'm a quick thinker, so as soon as I've seen the lights, I've run in over every scenario in my head. There's no way that you could replicate that light. It was bright, it was white, it was direct, it was throwing no shadows from any... It couldn't, you couldn't replicate that light. There's no way. There's no way. So you were there yeah. the night Sir No Face was captured? Yeah, it was myself, Nikki, and Kat. We always heard about this the uh, officers' quarters in building number two. You know, uh, security guards won't even go there, and even their dogs that they take, they won't cross the border of the property line. So that sort of sparked an interest. So from talking to Kat earlier, so she set the camera? We all just set the front. camera. There was no positioning. We just wanted to grab a room, hallway, and what else? So there, we just and sort then of locked it up? Just locked it up. And the next morning you come back, and this is on the camera? Yep, we just came back, clicked at our stuff. What do you think's on that film? I think it's, I think it's the spirit of someone. You think it's the spirit of someone? Yeah, he was formerly there and just slowly let themselves be known. Slowly let themselves be known. Slowly let themselves be known. Explain who you are in Craig's life. Behind every successful man, there's a, a more powerful woman. I'm his um, wife, a partner in crime, the brains behind a lot of things, I guess. You know, the silent partner. Um. And you have children? Yes. 
How many? We do. A daughter and two boys. Okay. Diesel being our youngest, and he's our margarita baby. That's what we call him. Okay. <laughs> It was a little bit unexpected, but he's been the best thing ever, ever, ever. Look, I know in my life I have a lot of people that are very close to me, but I can tell you right now, my wife knows me better than me. It's kind of the role of a wife, right? Yeah. Keep us in line, keep us from hurting ourselves and doing stupid shit, right? You know Craig better than anybody else. Yep. Could Craig have faked this? He wasn't no. even there that night. He was not even there. He that wasn't night. there. That doesn't and mean he couldn't have got people to go there no, and impossible. do something. Impossible, impossible in your impossible. mind. Absolutely impossible. I'm just. It, it, it's it's so you know when someone is so certain of something, it's just so hard to wrap my mind around it. And I wasn't there. I didn't experience no, no. it. You know right. what I mean? But for for someone watching this, there's just so many reasons to hoax. There's so many reasons to hoax. Give me a good one make your life better why it could bring fame fortune it could yeah. you could you could bring, i mean it, and look and it could but you know there, there's been times where um our kids have missed out on stuff because we've put money in towards whisper there's been time i've cut down on the groceries because you know craig needs a piece of equipment yeah. um we can't go on holidays because We've got all great stuff. reasons to hoax. You know? No, no, no. But this just goes to, yeah, it could be, could be. But, um, well, you know, yeah. Craig was a professional football player. Yeah. Craig knows what it's like to be in the limelight. He knows what it's like to stand in front of a crowd. He knows how good that feels. It's very well documented in, in our culture, too. When people leave the game, leave professional sports, they have a very hard time returning to normal life. His job now, he takes people across the Sydney Bridge. Correct. Right? Yes. Again, some people could say, very much a look at me job. Maybe this guy is at a point in his life where he would do anything for his children. Maybe he also misses the limelight a little bit. I'm saying mm -hmm. someone's going to say that. Like, what would your response to that be? Yes, he'd always want the best for his children, no matter what. But Enough to do faking, something like this? No, never, never. I mean, he's just, you know, he can't lie because I know straight through it. In your he entire marriage, you never caught him lying about anything. I have caught him lying, and that's how I know, because he can't do it. He's oh, really you're bad. bad at he's it. Bad. He's bad at it. Yeah, okay, he's gotcha, really gotcha. bad. Yeah, no, it, uh, it doesn't gotcha. work. But, you know, when you when you see him speak, he, he looks at you, he's, he stands up tall. There's there's nothing No behind, doubt you know, he's a so. natural-born leader. Natural-born leaders, you know, Hitler was a natural-born leader. You know, sure. They can be scary sure. yeah. because people follow that shit. And, yeah, they, and they will also shut the fuck up if they're told about certain things. Can you look me in the eyes and tell me what occurred out there was real? What occurred out there was 150% real chat. Without a doubt. What's up? This is Chad. I am home from Australia. Out here having a cigarette. I'm refreshing everything in my head right now, but uh, I think I just need uh, a long night's sleep. And uh, when I wake up in the morning, I'm going to talk to Justin first thing and get his uh, feedback. He's had, you know, quite a bit of time now to look over the footage and kind of 
you know, listen to the interviews and, and uh, tell me what he thinks. I'm going to tackle it myself. You know, knowing every detail surrounding this, uh, you know, investigation now and the footage, I want to just, you know, take a clean crack at it from the jump. Uh, go over everything. Make sure that I'm seeing everything that I should see. And uh, tomorrow night, I'm going to meet with Danny, which I'm really stoked about. He's going to be able to tell me straight up if, uh, if no face is CGI. And, uh, you know, I hope it's not. But also, if it is, I, you know, I hope I know the truth. I, I have to know the truth. So, good night, everybody. I'll see you in the morning. No sins as long as there's permission And deception is the only felony To never fuck nobody without telling me Really quickly, Craig, just kind of walk me through How this all came about as far as having access to the island I, I picked the boys up from school one day And, um... I heard the, the message go off on my phone and I knew I had an email, so I was only around the corner and drove down the driveway, the boys jumped out and I quickly had a look at my phone. I saw that it was from the Sydney Harbour Federation Trust. I opened up the email, had a quick scroll through it and more or less, you know, in that five seconds, I just realised that this government body was asking us to go out and investigate cockatoo violence knowing that government places are, are difficult to gain access to. This was a dream. That place is like a paranormal playground. They had just reopened the island to the public. You know, people spending a lot of time out there are going to experience things. And sure enough, right. they did. So the harbour wanted you guys to come out and see if this was in fact legitimate, if these claims were real. That's right, yeah. Why did they want to know if it was haunted? They were really interested in starting ghost tours or ghost hunts on the island right. itself. They thought it might have been a good way for the trust that runs the island to be able to make some money to maintain uh, the old buildings. So you guys go out, you capture yeah. the most mind-blowing shit I've ever seen, and you come back and you say to them, uh, we can confirm that this place is haunted, correct? We didn't even have to chat. They would come out with us. From the first night we were there, from the very first night we arrived on that island to start investigating, they were with us. Really? And it started to happen. Very first night, three representatives from the Harbour Trust were with us and experienced the most bizarre, mind-blowing paranormal activity. Um, to the point where they all had to sleep together in the one tent that night. They were that freaked out. So it wasn't just our testimonies and our evidence and our research. They experienced it too. They were there. They saw it and they heard it with their own eyes and ears. They experienced it too. They were there. They saw it and they heard it with their own eyes and ears. They experienced it too. They were there. They saw it and they heard it with their own eyes and ears. All right, so what's up? I'm up, I'm awake. Uh, before I jump into the footage, I'm gonna go give Justin a call right now and uh, rap out about him, see what he thinks. You know, you had time to look at the footage. Do you think that it was a human being filmed in the frame? At, at first look at watching that, no. It doesn't have joints and move with any kind of a weight. Human beings, no matter how many times you tried to get somebody to move like that, they couldn't do it unless you, you know, try to do something crazy and, and again, special effects. And the big distinction is when you put it next to the footage of Craig standing in the hallway. Now, they put the camera exactly where it was, just same condition. And they go back there and, like, clear as fucking day. <laughs> clear as me looking at you from eight feet away. It's Craig. You know, I mean, yeah. it, doesn't matter, it doesn't matter who you put back there. It's like, oh, that's them. <laughs> I mean, it's like, it is as clean and clear as anything that you can see. You would know if this was fake, correct? Do, do you think you could? I think I could make a fair assessment, yeah. Okay. I mean, in terms of it being CGI. 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 Right, is it CGI? Having said that, what are your thoughts on this piece of footage and this being that peeks around the corner? Uh, my initial? It just doesn't seem like it moves in 
what we would call reality. But there's no way for me to tell you that this is fake. There's no dead giveaway that you can say. Well, this is other, fake. other other than my, um, just it doesn't it moves. It, it, well, the argument would be a ghost would move differently than a human. That's true. That's true. That's I true. would agree with you. There's yeah. something not right. Like about that. it it does not move like a right. human at all. Like, I mean, if, if I peeked around that corner, right. I don't move like, <laughs> like it's arm swings. I don't know if you noticed that or not. Right. It has a really weird arm swing, mm -hmm. right? There. See it? Right. It's almost like it's swinging in slow motion. Right. Like, whoosh. It does not move like a human. No. I think we can both agree that's not a human being. No, no. Of course not. No, that's not a human being. Now, if you had to create something like that, that looked that grainy and compressed, could you do it? Oh, yeah. Really? Oh, yeah. I mean, could you nail it dead on? Or could it be, would it be similar? It would be pretty fun. Similar. It wouldn't be exact. There's no, there's no dead giveaways that it was for sure, Doc. Um, I took this into uh, Premiere and zoomed in as much as I could, and because it was so grainy, you couldn't really took it, take a look at the individual pixels to see if that actual element sits in the frame correctly. Because you would need a very high-end compositor with, you know, decades of experience to be able to make that really fit on a pixel-by-pixel pixel level. Right. But you can't definitively say, I know for sure this was doctored. No, I cannot. No, I cannot. Needless to say, I was floored by Danny's response. Not only was Danny unable to identify any evidence that suggested that the Sir No-Face footage was faked, in addition, a few weeks after this meeting, Danny emailed me a CGI recreation video of the Sir No-Face footage so that I could see what the original footage looked like in comparison to a CGI rebuild. While the similarities are obvious, the differences are unmistakable, as the CGI rebuild clearly appears to be artificial, as the shadows are much heavier than the original while the body of the original footage seems much more transparent than the CGI version. And last but not least, quite ironically, the face of the original Sir No-Face footage has far more detail than the CGI version. With all of this being the case, I have to agree with Danny's assessment. As verified when comparing the original Sir No-Face footage to Craig and Cat's recreation footage, the figure in the original footage is clearly not human. But at the same time, even when compared to a CGI rebuild side by side, the original Sir No Face footage lacks any definitive evidence that the figure was artificially created. There was simply nothing that Danny could positively identify as being CGI. So I ask you, if the figure in the original footage is not a human being, and if it's not a computer generated image, then what are we looking at here? After my meeting with Danny, I thought I knew exactly what I was looking at, until I began to take an even closer look at the footage. When doing the comparisons of all the recreation footage, because the focus of the comparison was facial detail, I had been resizing the footage to focus on the heads of the images so they would match. But when I tried to do a side-by-side -side comparison of the full frame, I found the top of the footage of the original Sir No Face footage to be cut off, which I quickly realized this was because the camera in the recreation footage was tilted up higher than in the original footage. Why was it tilted up higher? Because Craig is a six foot man, and Sir No Face is what appears to be a little boy, which makes all kinds of sense. As if you remember, Craig actually reported seeing a child spirit. What did he look like? Shadow. Yeah, that would explain this. Just a little white kid. And upon taking a deeper look into the history of Cockatoo Island, the island also served as a reformatory school for children. When I forced the perspective of them side by side, without question, Sir No Face is a young boy. Just under four and a half feet tall, maybe under. Very thin, very tiny, and I think this is really important for a couple reasons. This comparison definitively proves that this was not uh, your wife. This was not Richie, this was not Cat. You couldn't even make the claim that it was a fucking security guard unless you got a security guard that's about six years old. That night, uh, the kids were not out there, were they? 
No, no, not that yeah. much. Um, I think it's incredibly fucking cool that you saw a child spirit. And you just independently, without knowing what I was going to tell you, kind of identified what appears to be the age of this child. Uh, if you want to look at it right now, I can send it to you uh, privately. Pretty, pretty crazy shit. I mean, speechless at the moment. When we first saw it, we thought yeah. that thing is thin and tall. Yeah, it's no. not. And it's also in the very back of the hallway. Would that make it different in height at all? I mean, if this thing was standing at the back of that room? A little bit. It's maybe, you know, two foot behind you. Like, it wasn't a large space, so... Right. It wouldn't drop it three feet. The point being here, that is not a human adult spirit. That just changes the ball game, knowing that no face of the child. <laughs> Fuck. <laughs> you know what I mean? <laughs> Everything, you know, everything's changed. Everything makes crazy sense now, doesn't it? Yeah. Let me rewind a little bit here, because we haven't had this conversation yet. Um, uh, just so you know, mm -hmm. Danny absolutely concluded uh, it is not CGI. Obviously, he can't conclude it's a ghost, because he's not a fucking ghost expert, right? He's a CGI expert. So he can just tell us sure. if there's any telltale signs that would say this has been CGI. He's certain that it is not CGI, which is fucking awesome. So listen, cool. obviously part of this film is, you know, when I did those long interviews with you, I gotta go through and just try to make sure that, you know, everything you shared with me uh, makes sense to me. There's two areas, Craig, that I'm confused by. You know, one of the big things that you state over and over again in multiple interviews is that you didn't know anybody that could, you know, substantiate CGI. You know, you were, uh, when I brought up Danny, you know, you're like, I don't know anybody. I don't know anybody that can do this. What is interesting to me is uh -huh. in your tailgate series, yep. you have animation in the beginning of it. Um, you have this really cool fucking opening where um, oh, yeah, yeah. the splashing is on the wall of your right, of mm. your your whisper uh you know, yeah. team logo. Uh -huh. It's on the screen, it's three D graphics in the hallway. Uh this is clear animation. Uh mm. so I'm wondering who did this and where did this come from? Uh, I bought it. I bought it off one of these um uh, it was done on After Effects, and it's mm -hmm. just like a template. And, and all you do is you just type in, you just upload your JPEG logo, and then type in whatever words you want, and then it just does it. That stuff's fairly common, that people make templates, yeah. and they throw shit out there, and people can buy it. It was, it was fairly simple just to follow the instructions, and next minute, there you go. Okay, so cool. And the last thing, I need clarity on this. I need to understand this. Um, and it's, it, it, it's about your past as a rugby player. Um, yep. You mentioned when you did the interview, uh, I had asked you if you played professionally, and I was yep. certain you had told me before that you had played for the Bulldogs, and I can't find anything on that. Even though I got paid, I never played majors, so but all I can classify it to would be like your minor league. So the minor leagues of the Canterbury Bulldogs you played for? Yes, uh, Penrith Panthers. Penrith Panthers. And then the Bulldogs. Which is technically professional because yeah. you got paid, right? That's right. In saying that too, with, with the Bulldogs, that's when I got hurt. So if you want to be really technical, I never actually got to actually don the jersey to play. So you were contracted with the Canterbury Bulldogs and you got yeah. injured preseason. So you never technically got to take the field as a bulldog playing an official game. Yeah, does that make sense? Makes total sense. Yeah, no, makes total sense. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It was that simple. Craig never lied to me. He never danced around anything. From start to finish, he was honest, as was his wife, as was his entire team. Which, now that the investigation is over, I'm led to only one conclusion. Craig Powell and the West Sydney Paranormal Research Team have made history by capturing the first verifiable 
full body apparition on camera, thus ending a debate as to whether or not ghosts are real. They weren't lucky, nor was it an accident that the government reached out to Powell. It was fate. It was destiny. That email could have gone to anybody, but it didn't. It was sent to Powell. And it wasn't an accident that WSPR captured the Cerno face footage. It was the result of preparation, hard work, dedication, and commitment to the job at hand. They did everything right. From checking in with the security guards, to documenting the timing of events on a night that was seemingly quiet, to Powell painstakingly sitting through countless hours of footage, watching every last frame, without having any knowledge that Sir No-Face had allowed itself to be filmed. Had he looked away for just two seconds while reviewing that footage? Had he fallen asleep? Had he simply shelved the footage because it was a slow night? That footage would have never been seen. Sir No-Face would not exist. But again, they did everything right. Even when reviewing the footage of Sir's flashing lights, you've seen this gentleman throughout this entire film, in which I've yet to identify this person for a reason. He's not a member of WSPR, nor is he even a paranormal investigator. In fact, he's a skeptic. Who is he? He's Craig's travel agent. Why is he there? Because again, WSPR did everything right. Proper protocol dictates that when reoccurring evidence is happening, you find outside sources beyond your team to verify the evidence. And that's exactly what WSPR did. They rounded up a bunch of friends who are not investigators, and they took them to Sir's house to experience the magic for themselves. This figure, this being, this entity, is a ghost. Make no mistake about it. That is what you're looking at. So will skeptics still claim this is all a hoax? Absolutely. Just as skeptics, in the face of global catastrophe, still claim that global warming is a hoax. But let us never forget that although the denial of facts may create an argument, that does not take truth from fact, nor is truth affected by the argument. A settled fate is free of ridicule's effect, as the calling of one crazy never kept this ice from joining the sea long before it should. Math agrees in dimensional strings and that multiple realities are constantly colliding, yet the professor confesses only in silence what he believes, which is that he believes, which makes him just like three-fourths of us, as over 75% of the world claims to have had a first-hand paranormal experience. Yet we allow the 25% of disbelievers to control the viewpoint? Why? Because of fear? Because of ridicule? And why do we allow the James Randies of the world to tell us that just because he can recreate an event, that somehow takes away from the authenticity of the original event? And beyond that, why would anyone ever let a magician define reality? Right now, for both believers and skeptics, exists a place in the world where everyone can physically witness the blinding light of the other side. A place where souls can rest knowing that there is more to this life once death occurs. Right now, on Cockatoo Island, Sir No Face lives. But unfortunately, it's a place that you and I can no longer visit in this capacity as after experiencing the paranormal activity for themselves, the Australian government shut down WSPR, in which they are no longer allowed to take part in any paranormal-based activities on Cockatoo Island. And that, my friends, is incredibly unfortunate. Is incredibly unfortunate. Is incredibly unfortunate. They were witness to the lights. They were witness to seeing the lights that night. Um, and I assume they're scared to live in they, the shit out they, of it. It did to the point where I think their only comfort was to say it was fake. I think it scared them so much, you know, reaching into their rational mind and to try and calm them down a little bit was right. to try and find out how the hell we're faking this stuff. How are we being fraudulent in this and how are we creating these lights out of nowhere? The most awesome 
things would happen. And it was being scoffed at as, as being, you know, guys, you don't need to to put on this show. We, we just want to see how, how it runs. Um, wow. It got me a little bit pissed off. But the reason why that happened is because the phenomena was that full on that it scared the living shit out of them that much that, you know, their only solace, their only comfort was to, to think we had produced this. The day yeah. they were freaked out was, was an understatement. <laughs> the feedback I got from them was, look, Craig, um, that house where the lights are going off, look, I don't think we'll actually take people into it because it's just a bit too scary. The whole point of people going on these ghost hunts and doing these types of things is to have that experience. Right. There was real paranormal stuff happening and it, it scared the crap out of them.